Yes, you, are, you are really something. You are really something. All right, thanks everybody for Someone coming to, to the nice. session today. Uh, we're here today to talk about not just the facts, how to communicate opinion. Um, and this is a joint oh. presentation of AGU and the National Association of Science Writers. Uh, and the kind of the, the motivation for this is that scientists and journalists are trained classically to only observe the facts, to be objective, to just tell us what we know and not what we think. Um, but increasingly, it's important to uh, be persuasive, to write your opinion, to make an argument, to have a voice uh, for both science and journalism. Uh, so that's what we want to talk about today, how to do it, when to do it, what's really effective, and we'll share some of our stories about what works and what doesn't. Um, the, uh, and it, as I mentioned, this is sponsored in part by the National Association of Science Writers. Uh, we have an annual meeting every year. Um, please consider joining. I'll put information at the end. But uh, we're uh, experimenting with bringing NASW sessions to uh, uh, conferences and other places where there are a lot of great writers already, uh, hoping to kind of you know, serve our membership in that way. I'm chair of the Programs Committee, and this is sort of an experiment. So we hope it works well. Uh, we are going to start with just brief comments from each of the speakers, um, talking about some of it, what it is we do and how you can do it if you want. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, I think. So, and our panelists today, uh, Kate Galbraith is a freelance writer who's written for The Economist, New York Times, uh, Foreign Policy, bunch of bunch of places. Um, Keith Clore it is a writer at Discover. Um, so I'm, I'm moderating this committee as the vice president of the National Association of Science Writers, but I'll also speak a bit uh, in my role as an editor at Slate Magazine. And then Joe Rom, he hasn't been able to make it yet, but hopefully he'll come. He writes for Climate Progress. And then Josh Rosenau uh, is the policy, policy director at the um, uh, National Center for Science Education. So let's see, I, I'll, we'll let Kate go ahead and start, and then I'll come back and, and do sweep. Thanks, Laura. Hello, everybody. It's a great turnout. Um, um, this uh, uh, technology is a little fiddly. I'm a Mac person, not a PC person. So we'll see if uh, I can actually scroll down. That would be a triumph that may not be happening. Oh, is someone going to help me? Yeah. How do I down? scroll down? That's Basic. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Two people mystified. Okay, we're mystified as to how you scroll <laughs> on a PC. Hmm, how many journalists does it take? Um, yes, I've been using them, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so, anyway, I'll go back to my Mac after this. But uh, so I write uh, columns on energy environment for foreign policy, and I write a what's called the green column for the International New York Times. I do that once or twice a, a month. It's, that's typically more a reported piece, even though it's called a column, than an opinion piece. And I've written, um, I, I used to work for The Economist, which is nothing if not opinionated, and I still do book reviews for them, which is great fun. I wish I could show you um, this, which is, uh, uh, Upper right, second button. The double square is up. The double square. Oh, wonderful. This is revolutionary technology. Anyway, this has nothing to do with energy environment, but this is kind of me unleashed. I get to write about, uh, just sort of make fun of things like Texas, where I used to live, and they're, they're complete love of the Alamo and so on. And I will say that writing for The Economist um, now and, and over the years has made me appreciate the importance of humor in opinion writing. I mean, you never, uh, just as in speaking, you want to make occasional jokes about Max or whatever. You also, in writing, want to uh, just sort of engage people and be, be funny, uh, do a little tweak here and there where where possible. I remember that one of my um, uh, friends interviewed for The Economist years ago, and they said, uh, what, 
what do you like most about The Economist? And she said, the one word sentence. And that went down very well, you know, indeed, quite. <laughs> and you can make some wonderful points with just very few or just one word. Um, so let me try this scrolling technique here. Um, well, <laughs> it only works, ah, here's the, uh, oh, I guess this is just my, um, there, there's no scroll thing, that's the problem. Anyway, here's, here's uh, another piece I wrote um, last year about uh, uh, on the 40th anniversary of the uh, oil embargo, um, certainly very much on the mind of people in, in Texas. And, uh, you know, I, what I tried to do is just sort of right up front give people a reason why they're reading this and then sort of hit them with something that they, that will kind of lock them in. You know, it was Energy Pearl Harbor Day um, when this uh, embargo began. And that's, that's the sort of thing that I really try, you know, your opening lines are, are really just the most important. And I guess beyond that, I would just say that everything that applies to reported journalism also applies to opinion. You know, I'm not one that enjoys reading just screeds. I mean, I like to read stuff that is, is you know, acknowledges another side, uh, but says then why you should why you should go beyond it. And, you know, something that tells me something new, I mean, you know, climate change is a terrible thing. Like, okay, I'm not going to read that. It's not very interesting, but something that tells me something new about climate change or why it's a terrible thing. Uh, you know, I really admire uh, Thomas Friedman. I think his, his columns always tell me something new. And, you know, the New York Times occasionally has people, pieces like, uh, you know, vultures in, um, vultures in Africa are being poisoned uh, by eating elephant carcasses because people, the poachers don't want lots of vultures giving away their location. I mean, that was, it didn't have to be an opinion piece, but it was reported. And above all, I think we need more science opinion writing, more science writing, more opinion, more everything. So I'll stop there. Thanks. if I could figure this out. So my name is uh, Keith Clore, as uh, Laura introduced us, and um, I do have a blog at Discover Magazine. I guess that's the capac That's one of the capacities that I'm uh, showing up here today, but you know, I've also been a magazine editor through much of the 2000s. I was a senior editor at Audubon Magazine. I've also been a freelance editor at, uh, I'm sorry, freelance writer, mainly for magazines, um, written for science, um, and I think my first piece at science was um, in uh, 1998, and um, so, um, but I, I did start writing, uh, um, doing a more commentary, more opinionish style journalism, you know, after I left Audubon and became a freelancer. And I did, I started doing that when, here's Joe. <laughs> I, um, I started doing that when uh, I was on a fellowship at the University of Colorado in Boulder, a journalism fellowship. And I realized after being an editor for almost 10 years that I now needed to have some sort of web presence. And so I started a blog. And it was my own blog at the time. And a couple of years later, I Discover picked it up. And um, I didn't really um, pay much attention to blogs up until that point. As, as an editor, I was mainly consumed with just, you know, working on stories and commissioning, commissioning stories and editing them. So all of a sudden I had this freedom and, you know, I, you know, I was figuring out my way as, as a journalist. And um, so then, so the blog came along and I'm just going to pull up. And then a few years later that, a few years after that, I, I, I started doing some stories for Laura at Slate. And most of what I write about is, is on, you know, some heavily contested or not contested, but controversial issues in, in on the public, uh, such as GMOs and climate change. You know, f fiercely uh, politicized issues. So let me pull up some just some examples here for one second. Let me see if I can do this. Okay. Okay. So just to give you an example, um, when I started uh, branching out into opinionish style journalism, 
Um, here's a piece I wrote, GMO opponents are the climate skeptics of the left. This was a, a piece that Laura edited. And um, you know, this, this didn't go down well in some, in some quarters. <laughs> Um, but you know what? I was, I was really starting to um, look co more closely at the GMO issue. I hadn't really paid much attention to it, and I didn't see many of my colleagues wanting, you know, have much appetite to write about it. So I was looking uh, at the science and the politics of it and, and realized there was a tremendous amount of, you know, misinformation and myths about it. So, and, uh, and so I realized that, that there appeared to be a double standard, you know, among, among folks who would be considered, um, you know, fierce science defenders, you know, when, with respect to climate change and, you know, other, other issues and uh, evolution. But yet when it came to GMOs, um, you know, weren't so, you know, taken with the science, let's say. So, you know, so not, some folks didn't, didn't take that. Now there's a little bit, you know, when you write about this stuff, as I found out, you do put yourself out there. And so here I was, uh, you know, and I was critical of Tom Philpot at, at Mother Jones in that slate piece. So I, I don't blame him for then writing a piece, you know, defending himself. And by the way, I've written for Mother Jones. Um, he said, uh, this, his headline, some GMO cheerleaders also deny climate change. That was his, you know, comeback. So, uh, and he, he, you know, I was called a GMO lover in here and a GMO cheerleader. And, and so, you know, this is sort of how it starts. And, you know, you can kind of go back and forth on that. But it is something that now, you know, when I teach journalism, and I do teach uh, journalism almost every semester, I tell my students that you really need to be careful, you know, when you start to, you know, wear these multiple hats. If you want to be a reporter, you got to, you know, and you're going to write these kind of, um, uh, you know, opinion style uh, essays um, that you, you know, you have to be prepared for the criticism. You put yourself out there. And I, you know, and I certainly, you know, indulge in this at, in my blog. I, I like to be colorful. So here, here is, um, you know, I've been writing a lot about GMOs in the last few years. So uh, Nassim Taleb, if you know, he's the author of Black Swan, brilliant mind, brilliant guy. But I was, you know, Twitter is sort of microblogging, so I started paying attention, you know, what, to what he was saying and others. And, and I noticed he was just really, just, you know, really, uh, going after people in a way like, you know, really challenging their, um, you know, take, taking, you know, taking shots at their reputation. So um, at, when I asked him, I actually wanted to do an interview and do a story on, on an essay that he wrote. I'm sorry, a, a, a paper that he published recently. And he must have Googled me and saw, you know, some of what I've written. And then he, he comes back and writes, uh, um, do, you, do I get indirect funding from GMO corporations? Can you state this here, which is on the record? So this was my, this was the question I got from him on Twitter. And you know, he's, he's done the same to some other colleagues. Anybody who um, apparently is, you know, in his mind, uh, pro-GMO or, or um, defending the science on biotechnology uh, suddenly is a Monsanto shill or, you know, taking in the pocket of Monsanto. So, um, so that was one. You know, and I've also written um, a fair amount about climate change. And, um, you know, I'm, I definitely have been um, uh, critical of some of the, uh, um, you know, some of the, uh, I don't know how you would put it, but, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely been questioning and, and, and critical of some folks who, who um, and, and, well, I would say some folks, but, uh, how should I put this? Um, I've been I've I've been questioning of certain conventional wisdom and memes and uh, you know some 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 of the rhetoric that's been uh, in the in the climate discourse, and so I get you know I get taken to, I get taken to task for that too. So here's here's a post that I don't really know who this guy is. I think he's a I think he's a you know somebody who's fairly concerned about uh, climate change. And he was just taking a shot at something I wrote, and he, this was the headline he put, Keith Clore proposes killing millions of deniers. I try to talk him down. It's a play, it's, he's clearly being comical. But as I was telling Laura, in, you know, um, just before the session started, you know, my, my two boys are, are um, seven and 10, and now they like to Google my name, you know, and they hear I'm go writing a story. And so, you know, who knows what comes up? So this is something that, you know, I have to explain now. <laughs> 
And, you know, I don't shy away from taking on some of the heavy hitters out there. This is a post that I wrote a few weeks ago. Again, as I said, I'm writing a lot about GMOs, and Bill Nye recently made some statements um, that were um, somewhat dubious on biotechnology. And so here's my headline. Bill Nye explains why he's a GMO skeptic. And um, as I said, there are people who are fierce defenders of climate science, but yet when it comes to um, agricultural biotechnology, they are skeptical of the science. And so what I do on the blog and, and elsewhere is I sort of ask of why the double standard? You know, why is, why is what the National Academy of Sciences says on climate change acceptable, but what they say on GMOs not? And, you know, I get in trouble for that. People don't like that when I point out these double standards. So I pretty much will leave it there. I mean, I, don't, I didn't really talk about, um, you know, how I, how to communicate facts, so to speak. Yeah, so I, th I just wanted to give you a flavor of, you know, what, you know, sort of what I do here on the blog. Thank you. I can, I have a, or did you want to, I know you just got here if you're catching your breath. Okay. While he's doing that, can I get, uh, I'm just curious about the audience. How many people here consider themselves primarily scientists first? Yeah, okay, good. And how many people consider themselves primarily uh, writers, communicators? Good, okay, excellent, nice mix. And we've got, um, coming up, we've got a bunch of different examples. I think Josh is more an example of a scientist, and Joe also, and then I've got some examples of scientists who've written for a slate or journalists who have, so we'll hope to kind of balance that out. So, Thank you for having me here. This is unexpected. I got the, the email like yesterday afternoon. So kick me when, when I run out of time. I didn't try to time this or plan it necessarily. So just nudge me when it's, uh, when it's too late. I work at the National Center for Science Education. We're a nonprofit devoted to defending evolution and climate change in schools. I come to that with a background in science. I was a grad student in evolutionary biology in Kansas in the mid 2000s when interesting things were happening in Kansas. For those of you who, who remember, there were creation of school boards elected, and I was supposed to be writing my dissertation, but there was this other thing that was really interesting happening. And I got involved in that, and it turned out that I was, I could write thousands and thousands of word, words on that topic, but then sit down to write on my dissertation. It was like, well. <laughs> so important lesson learned, right? <laughs> Maybe there's actually a way to make a living out of that. And a position opened up at NCSE, and uh, I've been doing that full time now. So, you don't have to read all of this, uh, but in thinking about sort of talking to scientists about being opinionated, this, this passage from uh, something Dan Jansen wrote in 1986 about the future of tropical ecology. He was basically saying, the, the bolded text there, if biologists want a tropics in which to biologize, they are going to have to buy it with care, energy, effort, strategy, tactics, time, and cash. Right? He wasn't just saying, what is the future of this academic field? He was saying, if we want to be biologists still, we can't just be in the lab. We have to be thinking about the rest of the world. We have to be communicating what we know. We as scientists can see clearly what's happening and what the irreversible consequences for biology and humanity will be and how the solutions must be constructed. And I think the same thing applies to climate change and to a lot of the other issues that scientists here at AGU and that science journalists who are who become, in the course of their beat reporting, ex you know, in some cases, the, sort of the world expert on that topic that they're covering, uh, that there is an obligation there not just to say, this is, this is what we know, but also to go beyond that to what, this is what we should do about that. I think stopping at that, this is what we know, I'll leave it to someone else to, to go on from there, is a little bit of a cop-out. And I think the public wants to hear that. In, in a lot of different surveys from people, this is from, from Pew on, on the right and from the National Science Board's Science and Engineering Indicators on the left, scientists are among the most respected voices on, on relevant topics. Um, behind the, only the military and the National Science Board's list, behind the military and teachers in the Pew list, ahead of doctors, clergy, journalists, alas. And when you ask, I did this chart last night, so it's not as pretty as I would like it to be. Um, 
but uh, the National Science Board asked people, if you want policy recommendations about global warming, they asked in 2006 and again in 2010, which group do you think, uh, for each of these groups, they weren't asked to pick each of them, but for each of them, do you think that they are generally trying to do what's best for the country or best for their own narrow interests, and rating that from one to five? And you see, scientists, by and large, are perceived as thinking about national interests, not their own personal interests. And I think one of the fears that scientists often have in trying to write in opinionated ways is that it will seem self-interested, that no one wants to know what scientists say, I need to be impartial and above the fray. But the public recognizes that scientists know something about what they study and want to know what they have to say. Don't think that that's purely partisan or purely um, ideological. I think there is a lot of room there for scientists to do that. Uh, there are downsides. This is, I stole this from Susan Fisk and Cindy Dupree's paper that just came out earlier this year from a uh, Sackler Colloquium at the National Academy of Sciences, where they found that scientists are, are really well regarded. Um, their competence is really rated highly if you, ask, if you ask people about this, but they're not seen as terribly warm. They're not seen, seen as inviting friendly people who you just want to sit down with and have a beer. They're more in a circle that, that when you expand this sample and do the same thing with other groupings, it's sort of a group that tends to be a little bit psychopathic in like a <laughs> clinical sense, which is not necessarily where scientists ought to be perceived and not where they have to be perceived. Um, if you ask people to name, can you name a living scientist? Ask someone just out on the street, two thirds of them will say no. And if you then, for the ones who say yes, if you ask them to do so, you get names like Stephen Hawking, who is a scientist and is alive, Albert Einstein, who was a scientist but is not alive, um, Pasteur, Curie, Salk, Robert Jarvik was, this was 2009, so he was in, in uh, TV commercials at the time. But, and they would also name people like Al Gore or Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, who were living but not, strictly speaking, scientists. So that also represents a huge opportunity for scientists. People want, want to hear from scientists, want to know what scientists think, and want to know what scientists do. And I think the most effective way to express those opinions and to describe them is, well, so how many of you think that climate change is happening? How many of you think it's caused by humans? How many of you think we should do something about it? Okay, so the first two of those are, one of these things is not like the other, right? The last of those, goes beyond necessarily the strictest of the science, but what you know about the climate change is informed by, or what you think we should do about climate change is informed by what you know about it. To some extent, the public's, the, 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 the log jams that we have over policy, by no means all of it, but some of it is, is just a, a lack of understanding of, of the issues and, and of the urgency of the issues. And one way of getting to that is to talk about how we know what we know, how we know the science that we know, and how we as scientists, as journalists, as others, have reached the opinions that we have. And that means moving beyond the sort of, the, the too simple, too narrow idea of the scientific method, the sort of grade school, you ask a question, you form a hypothesis, you gather data, you draw conclusions, simple, straightforward, but not how it actually works, not how scientists actually work, not where the, the the research comes from and not how scientists draw broader conclusions. Science operates in this much broader social context and that's important and people should understand that. And, it, and when they do understand that, when you humanize the science, there's a lot of opportunity actually to, people, scientists are often afraid that by humanizing themselves, by seeming fallible, by seeming, by talking about all this social context, that you somehow make the science less credible, but I've always found that it makes it much more credible if you can talk about, here is this actual person who did this actual research. Here's why this person thought it was really interesting to go and ask this bizarre question. Why did I spend a couple years of my life staring at rat penises? It was interesting. I mean, what do you want? So people understand that science is empirical, that it's testable, that it's robust, that it's boring, but they don't always understand that it is tentative and why the things that we can say as scientists that are not tentative, that climate change is happening, is no longer a tentative statement. Why not? I don't think that the public really understands that, and I think that that's something that scientists have a lot of room to do something about. Uh, all of the research that is being presented here, all of the ways that climate change touches and shapes the work that scientists do, 
um, has made it no longer a tentative conclusion, but a really certain conclusion. That science is social. Right? I mean, you're all here. You could all be sitting in your labs doing your thing, but you all came together at AGU to talk about science. That's part of the scientific process. The, the weird grudges and the weird fights and the bizarre lab experiments that seem like they're gonna ruin everything are an important part of the story and can inform an opinion piece and help make it clear where that opinion comes from and put its a context on it. And, and making the science, humanizing the science, humanizing the ideas and attaching it to a person. Why do you, why did you become a geoscientist? Why did I want to study evolutionary biology? That's part of the explanation of why it's so important to me to defend evolution in public schools. So if I'm writing an opinion piece about teaching evolution, part of that is how did I become an evolutionary biologist? Why is evolution so important to me? And it's usually something a lot more exciting than what people experienced in their science classes um, when they were in school. You do it by telling stories, right? How do you make a story about baseball statistics interesting? They did it, but you make it the human story. And the same thing for, for Henrietta Lacks. HeLa cells are incredibly important to modern biology, but to make it interesting and to make it a best-selling book that Oprah optioned for a HBO movie and all sorts of other things, you tell the story of Henrietta Lacks, the woman whose cells became this incredibly important cell line. So that's, I'll, I'll stop there. I think, I don't know how long that lasted, but um, do check us out. There's a lot more on our website. We've got a blog, we've got other stuff. Um, and I look forward to chatting more. All right, good. So I'm going to go through now some of the stories that have been most popular on Slate in the past few years, just to give you an example of, of what works. And you know, we keep meticulous records of, of uh, what stories get the most hits. Um, it's kind of ridiculous how, uh, how much data we have, um, but it's, it's very clear. The trends are very clear. Explanatory pieces, investigative pieces, there is an audience for them, but the audience for opinionated, argumentative, voicey, funny, angry stories is much larger. Um, and and they, these stories tend to draw in a lot of people who don't wake up in the morning and think they know anything or care anything about science, but it turns out if you present it in an opinionated way, they do. Um, so I'll just run through some of the top ones. Uh, this is for the scientists in the room especially. If Fox News and um, idiot senators who hate science start criticizing your research, defend it. And if you can defend it with humor, and yes, if people are making fun of you for studying duck genitalia, so Patricia Brennan, this is what she does. She's devoted her life, you would appreciate this, to studying duck genitalia. There are very good reasons for it. And They're she explained them. They're fascinating, yeah. Oh, we've got some. Well, I, unfortunately, I didn't load the video, but if you, <laughs> you've got to see the video. They, uh, she, anyhow, she made these glass tubes that you can see the penis there. It's a corkscrew. It's got to fit in the tube a certain way, it, explosively. Um, anyhow, this, this was a, a big hit. Uh, people who had never thought about how evolutionary, psychology, or evolutionary biology works uh, watched these duck penis videos and hopefully learned something and were amused and spread it along on social media. And in all of our stories here on Slate, and I think a lot of places, you'll see there's like a Facebook icon and a Twitter icon, and you can see how many people uh, wanted to share it with their friends. And that unfortunately is the way, or fortunately if you can harness it, uh, that is the way to get your stories read and shared, is um, to, to do something that appeals to people and makes them, make them want to make all their friends read it on Facebook. And uh, speaking of Facebook, if you ever have a story to write about Facebook, it will be very popular because um, people are, are ridiculously invested in this social medium. Um, and so another thing to do about opinion pieces is if you think something is right or wrong, you have the standing, and if you can make the argument, you have the right, you should make the case. You should say, this is wrong, this is great, this is outrageous, this is ridiculous, this is silly, this is funny. Um, this is really, you know, a lot of it is dangerous. So, so this one, um, this was one of the first stories to come out after there was some news that Facebook had been experimenting with people's news feeds, uh, presenting either a, a slightly higher proportion of positive or negative stories, and then looking to see, based on subsequent posts, whether people seemed to be happier or sadder. And it turned out there was a small effect. And uh, the first reaction was, oh gosh, wow, how, how interesting is that? Um, but on, uh, anyhow, there was a, an internal discussion at Slate saying, no, they can't do this, it's against um, 
Human Subjects Committee guidelines. It's against the, uh, the standards of PNAS where this paper appeared. So we wrote this very, you know, fairly angry, you know, don't do this to us, you're manipulating us, this is terrible, it's unethical. And the story went bananas on Facebook of all places. So uh, it got a lot of attention. So if, if anything, um, and we'll come back to this again and again, but um, like my, my standard advice for writing opinion pieces uh, comes from Molly Ivins. Does, has anybody heard of Molly Ivins before or read her? Yeah, she was wonderful. Um, uh, so I took a, a, a class with her on opinion writing uh, when she was a visiting scholar where I did grad school. And uh, she talked about when you're writing columns, when you're writing opinions versus writing news or investigative pieces, your big question is always, well, what should I write about if it's not necessarily tied to baking, breaking news? And her standard advice was if, you, um, if something makes you angry or if something makes you laugh, that's what you should write about. So humor, humor and anger are the most animating emotions for writers and for readers. Uh, another really good genre to think about for opinion pieces is uh, the debunking. Um, so this is a story about how uh, people share, uh, you know, um, uh, conspiracy theories and uh, you know alternative medicine ideas and just a lot of kind of anti-science foolishness on Facebook. And we've in a lot of places do regular debunkings of this crazy video that's going around. It's completely wrong. Uh, and so this was sort of a meta story, saying not only is it wrong, but you need to stop sharing it, and if you do share, you're part of the problem. So it was calling people out plus debunking, and those are two kind of methods of doing opinion that are very, tend to be very successful. Uh, this is another example of debunking, um, basically uh, making fun of people's stupid ideas. Uh, if you can do it sort of gently, uh, it, it animates people who already know that giving dogs acupuncture is a really bad idea. Um, and hopefully the people who are confused about it or see it on, going around on their own Facebook feeds or have their friends talking about it, uh, but are a little unsure about, oh, is this just some you know, brilliant new veterinary technique I don't know about, uh, if, you know, <laughs> if you have an opinion about it and want to say, no, absolutely not, this is stupid, don't do it, uh, and write about it, that kind of gives ammunition to people who are trying to, to understand if this is right or not. And then this is sort of Josh's expertise, the uh, creationism. Uh, there's an endless appetite for stories that are calling out, exposing, trying to stop creationism in public schools. This was our most read science story of the year. Um, uh, and it was a big investigation that had a map to go with it about all the, uh, the ways that public schools are using textbooks that were made by creationists. Uh, oh, and the, so one, one big thing to remember is always kick up so it's really good to start fights or to respond to fights, as Patricia Brennan did with the, with the corkscrew genitalia. So basically Fox News and a bunch of conservative senators were calling her research into question, and so she fought back. And you know, the, as, as, um, as Keith mentioned, you, know, there, you can get into really interesting fights. It, it's fun, it's energizing, it, uh, it can be a good way to get people who don't care about an issue to think about an issue. Um, but you always want to make sure that you're kicking up to somebody who's more powerful than you are, otherwise you're a jerk. Um, so this was, you know, this is actually an, an elderly scientist with a fixed income who just needed some extra money, and I wrote this nasty thing about him. Um, but since it's Jim Watson, that was okay. <laughs> and this is another example of picking a, you know, engaging in a dialogue. Uh, and this is Ray Pierre Humbert, who some of you may know. He's a, a, a climate scientist. Unfortunately, he's on sabbatical, so he couldn't come this year. But he's um, calling out the, uh, the Wall Street Journal for publishing another argument that, oh, climate change, why should we bother? It's too expensive. Um, and then this is, I think, was it, yeah, Kate was talking about some of the you know, sharp language and, and, and how important it is to grab people with opinionated language right away. And I just love the, uh, the opening of this. If there's a gene for hubris, the 23andMe crew has certainly got it. And so you know right away, okay, this, this is an opinion piece. And you want to announce it right away. You don't, don't want to be necessarily too subtle with your opinions. Um, so I'm going to stop now and, and, and let Joe speak, and then we'll come back to the Q&A. Um, but just a reminder, you can join NASW. We have all kinds of resources, and there are coasters in the back with uh, all kinds of information about the various things that NASW does. Do you want me to turn this off? Uh, yeah. Actually, I don't know. I just wanted to get an image up there, but I realized oh, yeah. I may be beyond my capability. Um, Let's plug it on, uh, on a website. Uh, I just, I just want to get that image. Yeah, I think uh, we're done with this one if you want to unplug it. Oh, you can actually plug it. Yeah, that would be fine. All right, I will talk while you do that. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, howdy, thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, 
I uh, uh, blog in Washington, D.C. At, at, at Climate Progress, uh, which, I, which I founded. And um, Washington, D.C. is uh, the land of politics. Uh, and I actually, when I was at the Department of Energy um, many years ago, I learned the definition of politics. It comes from the Greek poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning small blood-sucking insects. Um, so there's a lot, uh, a lot of opinion blogging to be done. Um, Rolling Stone ended up calling me America's fiercest climate blogger, um, but um, I'm people who know me don't necessarily think of me as, as terribly fierce. Uh, I, um, in fact, uh, someone, I don't know if they're in the room, told me at a meeting that, that they were talking to some journalist and they said that they met me and I was a lot nicer in person. So um, I, I think, you know, I, I came into this because uh, my, my parents were journalists, uh, really. My father's a, a newspaper editor, my mother. Uh, wrote, wrote columns and then freelance stuff. And of course, that's why I decided I was never going to become a writer or journalist because it pays poorly and the job conditions are terrible. So I wanted to get a real occupation and my uncle's a physicist uh, and he was a great inspiration to me. So I got a, a, a physics PhD and I, I went on to be interested in public policy and, and ultimately worked the Department of Energy uh, at the, uh, uh, as acting assistant secretary for efficiency and renewables and then did a lot of consulting uh, on clean energy and uh, was doing that and doing that until uh, uh, my brother lost his home in Hurricane Katrina. He lived in past Christian, Mississippi and there was 20 feet of water a mile inland and the house looked like uh, the interior, it had been to the interior of a washing machine. And, and he um, asked me, it's not perhaps what you think, he, he asked me if he should rebuild his home, which uh, most people have not lost their home. It's a very big, traumatic thing that you've lost your home. Obviously, it's, if, it's, if you're in a place that's dangerous, it's a big deal as to whether you're going to rebuild there or not, because the one thing you don't want to do is go through it again. So he asked me. He knew I had studied uh, physical oceanography at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography with, with Walter Monk. Um, so that was, of course, uh, the summer of 2005. And I started talking to the world's leading climate scientists and attending seminars and reading the literature. And, and that was when I realized two things. One, that the situation was more, more dire than I thought. And two, that scientists were doing a, a particularly lousy job at communicating. Um, and so I decided to stop doing the clean energy consulting and, and just do communicating. And I was able to to find a place that was interested in communications, which in this case was the Center for American Progress, uh, which had launched a couple of years ago, and it was, its job was to, to do you know, newfangled communications as much as anything else. And, and they were doing blogs, and they said, how would you like to do a blog? And I didn't know a lot about that, but I started doing uh, once a day, and, and nobody much was paying attention for many, many months. But after about nine months, there were some people reading it, and, I went and talked to all the bloggers and had a meeting and said, how do I get more readers? And they said, well, you have to blog more. And then I said, well, okay, but then you'll have to pay me more because I was just 40% time. And, and so it evolved into something uh, that, that now has a staff of about eight or nine people and, and uh, has uh, between its, its parent blog, uh, uh, Think Progress and Climate Progress, have 1.6 million Facebook fans between us and about almost 400,000 Twitter followers. And, uh, you know, so it, it can reach a lot of people. Uh, the, the post that I did on the fifth assessment report had 22,000 Facebook likes. Uh, and the Washington Post piece had 8,500. So it's, it's obviously been, been, been very rewarding. Um, in terms of how I think about it, um, I, I tell people that the, the, if the key to blogging is what I call the four Qs, uh, quantity, quality, quickness, and quirkiness. Um, and certainly, you have to be a source of regular information. No one's going to come back. Obviously, it's got to be high quality information. If, if it, you present information that's not true, uh, easily debunked, uh, you know, and on this day and age of the web, your facts, your sources are incredibly easy to trace immediately, and your words live forever. So if you were to acquire a reputation as posting stuff that's not true, 
you're not gonna get a following. Uh, quickness, that's the essence of the internet. And of course, there's the trade-off between the quality and the quickness, and that's, that's the challenge for modern journalism. It's why a lot of modern journalism isn't, isn't so good anymore. There's more of an emphasis on quickness over quality, and it's, it's among the biggest decisions you have to make at any given time. Interesting stories come emailed to you all the time, and you say, wow, this is an incredible story, if true. Um, uh, that was the famous line someone said about the Bible. Important, if true. So um, that's what everything that comes across your desk, and you, you have to make that decision, and there it's a matter of reaching out to um, your sources. And I, I, I certainly have, have said, and I continue to say, that, that the single biggest determinant of uh, my trust and I think the quality of any climate reporter is how much they talk to climate scientists. Um, and the best news stories online, they talk to a lot of climate scientists. And the more you talk to, the more likely you are to get an accurate story. In part, obviously, because climate scientists are the experts. And in part, if you know climate scientists, they will say a lot of things off the record that they're not prepared to say because scientists hate uh, type 1 errors. They hate to say things that can't be proven true. Um, although, as Naomi Oreski said, it means they make a lot of type 2 errors, which means they don't say things that, in fact, are true. And that's why things like the IPCC report are terribly conservative and why if you really want to know what's going on, you have to talk to a lot of climate scientists and, and get the feel of their 40 and 50 year career as to what's really going on and piece it together. And I suppose stuff, you know, the question of whether things that a lot of climate scientists believe but can't formally prove in the literature are those facts or are those opinions or is there somewhere in between? And I, I, I guess that is the judgment of, of, of every writer. I, you know, I, the fourth cue is quirkiness, which is to say your voice. Nobody's going to come back. There's staggeringly many blogs and sources. So if, if you don't have an interesting way of saying it, an interesting worldview, no one's going to come back. That's just a fact. You, you, you read Paul Krugman's column even though you kind of know what he's going to say. But why? Because you, you trust his judgment, he has a voice, he, he, he thinks in the world a certain way, and if you're interested in knowing how a person who thinks the way Paul Grugman does thinks about X issue, you're going to read him, even though you probably have a pretty good idea. So, you know, it's, 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 it's obviously very crucial that you have a voice. I think um, I had made a decision after my... Uh, talking to all the climate scientists all in 2005, 2006, that I, I was going to be very blunt. Uh, that, that I didn't see the point in pulling any punches because we don't have a lot of time. We're getting one shot at this. And like I said, you know, scientists are erring on the side of, of least drama as, as, as has been published in the literature. And, and I don't try to err on the side of being wrong. I just try to present what I think is my understanding of what the people I think are the best scientists think about a subject. And, you know, I think the other mistake the IPCC mis has made is, is, and climate science in general, although it's climate science communications has gotten a lot better. So there's no question about that, is, is focusing again on what you can say with certainty. Most people in their life base a lot of decisions on the plausible worst case. And the scientists know what the plausible worst case is, they just don't generally like to talk about it. And it wasn't until a few years ago that you got a lot of studies of impacts past a doubling of CO2 because the scientific community thought that seeing how bad a doubling was and ha hearing it over and over again, no politician, no country in their right mind would ignore them decade after decade and actually do a doubling. And obviously, we are headed towards a tripling or quadrupling, uh, though recent signs indicate we, we, uh, with the US-China deal that, that we could avoid that. So I, I tried to adopt a perspective. When I'm writing, I try, when I'm trying to figure out the angle, I try really hard to think, what, how are future generations going to look at this? That, that uh, probably is, is, is one of my main guiding principles. Obviously, there's no way of knowing. I just know they're disenfranchised, and, and nobody at all is speaking for them. So it's probably better to at least try to imagine what they're thinking than to ignore them entirely. And um, so that's why there tends to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a uh, moral outrage 
uh, component to the opinion side of what I write uh, because we are living a lifestyle that they can't. We are not passing on to them a form of wealth that they can in, uh, uh, obtain doing what we did. We're basically trying to run out the clock, hoping we can get another 10 or 20 years of our current lifestyle and acting like teenagers with no regard for not just our children and, future, and the next generation, but possibly, we believe the literature from no one else, we're a thousand years. I mean, literally, the difference between acting proactively and acting inevitably, which we're going to do, have a carbon-free economy, is, is a matter of decades. We go carbon-free voluntarily by mid-century, or we go carbon-free... Uh, uh, we're forced to, because we're not going to burn all the fossil fuels, because that's a plus 10 degree Fahrenheit world, by, uh, you know, uh, by the end of the century. So we're talking about a few decades different between uh, a livable future for billions of people or a thousand, potentially a thousand years of irreversible uh, um, misery. So it is beyond immoral to be doing what we're doing. And I have said, uh, and I think strongly, and I, I, I agree, um, I think, with what Josh said, scientists, of course, are trained to speak without emotion. But that creates a disconnect in credibility when you're talking to the public to dryly talk about the impacts of a tripled world is to undercut the credibility of your message because no human being that you're talking to other than another scientist could possibly hear what you're saying and not be outraged if you believe it if you don't believe it you should write something else but if you believe what the literature says what the national academy says what the ipcc says the aaas you know what the literature says then doing nothing is is morally untenable but if you don't express that how are you going to persuade someone that it's true now you know it, it, is it a fact that it's morally untenable? I view it that as a fact. I don't view that as an opinion. Um, you know, and I, I won't, in the interest of time, I won't go through this, but the Founding Fathers thought intergenerational equity was so obvious that they hardly ever talked about it. But the notion that you could destroy the soil in your private property so the next person couldn't grow food on it was inconceivable to them. It was, it was self-evident. So, you know, I think that um, you are more credible with emotions. Uh, I would just end by, with, with two things. I think the scientific community has not done a good job of humanizing itself, and as a, which wouldn't matter if we lived in a perfect world. But we happen to live in a world where there's a trillion dollar campaign to dehumanize you and to make it look like you're actually driven by money and you're corruptible and, and it's uh, things that are ridiculous to anybody who knows scientists, but as we've seen, most people don't know scientists. And since there's no positive messaging campaign, I was just talking to someone who said, well, you can't have a message that a duck is a cat and just keep saying a duck is a cat and a duck is a cat and people will believe you. And I said, that's generally true. Uh, unless the ducks don't do any messaging at all about themselves. Uh, and if I, you give me Madison Avenue and a hundred billion dollars and everyone's going to believe a duck is a cat. Uh, and as can be seen in this world, there are a lot of people who do believe ducks are cats. Um, in fact, they believe that, that, that rocks are cats and they believe that insects are cats and they believe that watermelons are cats. So, uh, and, and you know, I wrote a whole book on this, so I don't have to talk about it at all, but, but the key to expressing and facts is logic. Well defined, the enlightenment triumphed in communicating that. Sadly, for 95% of people, they're not persuaded by the facts. Um, I think that's probably well known to everyone in the room. There is an equally strong science of persuading people with uh, opinions. And it is called rhetoric. It was figured out by the Greeks 25 centuries ago. It was raised to a high art by the Romans and then perfected in English uh, by the Elizabethans. It's hardly taught anymore, but modern social science has shown that it's all true, which is why Madison Avenue uses it. And I wrote a whole book, Language Intelligence, Lessons on Persuasion from Jesus, Shakespeare, Lincoln, and Lady Gaga. And if you want to know how to communicate with feeling and emotion, the facts, so that the people who are communicating disinformation with feelings and emotions don't trump you, then you have to un study the art and science of communications. And, and to do so and to communicate in this, and to not do so and to communicate in this world would be like uh, saying MIT was going to teach physics but not calculus. 
Uh, it's just as simple as that. It's not taught anymore. It is, it is basic and fundamental as that. And I will leave you there. Thank you. show your whole screen, I think. Oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. So uh, I, I, I was just talking to a group about what I was going to write about today, and I wrote, the best opinion journalism combines the author's unique personal perspective and personal voice with a solid grounding in the facts. But it ends up, for a lot of us, that you just think we're grumpy cat. Um, but I believe in what's written, and I, and I think that, that um, this is how I would define, you know, the best opinion journalism. And it's not just your opinion, because nobody cares just what's your opinion. Your informed understanding of the facts, coupled with your human emotions and experience, that's, that's what opinion journalism is. Thank you. All right, good. So we're open for questions now. Anybody have a question? For any, anybody, you can direct it to the whole panel or anyone in, in particular. It's a good question. It, it's a, the answer would be, would be really, really long. I was on a panel with Naomi Oreskes yesterday, and he, she pointed out there used to be a time when scientists spoke to the public all the time, gave public lectures around the turn of the, la the 19th century, very, very well received. Um, I, uh, I, I think there are a lot of reasons. For me, I realized uh, uh, we're, we're never taught communications. There's no mandatory communications classes. There's hardly any elective ones, and, and obviously scientists go into science because they're more comfortable with facts and numbers than they are, per se, with, with communications and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I think what scientists have been taught in communications, which is use big words, don't repeat yourself, be as fact and literal, as fact-based and literal as possible, is not only not good communications advice, it's actually the exact opposite of what the great communicators uh, and rhetoric uh, uh, would teach. And so I, I think there's a discomfort level uh, I think, you know, the disinformation campaign and the hostility with which they've been greeted has been uh, a, a, a surprise to some. Uh, if I can, uh, those who read my blog know uh, who I'm going to hold to a large degree responsible, and that is the media. I mean, the media is called the media because it intermediates, or at least it used to. And, you know, maybe it was an unusual time the, from post-World War II through whatever, before the invention of cable TV, but, you know, there were professional journalists who understood science. And, who, and, and ultimately, there were professional journalists who understood climate. And I think everyone in this room knows most of those people have lost their full-time jobs at most major media outlets. There's hardly any science sections anymore. There's a science and health section once a week at the Washington Post. The Washington Post, it's for policymakers. I mean, it's the number one newspaper read by policymakers. It's got a science and health, and it's mostly health. Because um, it's an entertainment business. So I think that... The, the media, and, I, and let's not even, I don't want to blame individual reporters because it's the decision makers higher up, it's the editors and publishers who have created this world, but that just means that it's incumbent on everybody in a world where you can be your own journalist, where I can reach as many people sitting at my desk as my father could with his entire newspaper staff. You, if you're dissatisfied with the message that is coming out, either from a c community of scientists or the media, do it yourself. It's gonna, you have to be willing to enter the fray. Those of you who know Mike Mann know 
that he has done that. I think he's done it effectively. It comes not without some cost. It comes not without some cost for me. Someday my daughter will Google my name. And as Keith said, it, you know, I will have a long story, a, you know, a very long story to be telling her. And, and that's just a decision you make. But, but at, we're now at the point where I don't think we can blame anybody else. It's just up to us to personally do it. Can I, can I jump in there, Laura? I do have um, some suggestions. I think there are a number of ways that scientists can communicate that uh, don't just include uh, writing opinion pieces or blogs. You know, one is call up uh, your, your favorite journalist and tell them what's up. I mean, I had a conversation, uh, I was talking for other reasons with a fellow University of Richmond who had just been studying in India, and he said, I've got a great story for you. You know, India's just launching an energy efficiency cap and trade style program. I was like, oh my goodness, you know, this is amazing. And I turned into an International New York Times green column, and I was kind of like, wow, this is great that I get to write it and not him, but he could have, you know, if, if sort of I were a scientist, I would maybe sort of try to do that, try to do that myself, or again, seek out a journalist. You can talk to the public. Um, one of the people I admire is Catherine Hayhoe, a Texas Tech University climate scientist who's uh, uh, very Christian, very religious, and she goes to talk to religious groups about why uh, climate science is, is real and why it's important. And there's also um, um, a website out of uh, either Boston University or somewhere in Boston, I, uh, I think it's relatively new, new to the US, it's called The Conversation, and it is for academics uh, uh, and to write, and it's edited by journalists, and so that's something that um, is, is neat to watch. I think they're about to ramp up their energy environment section. And I would also, so I see Liz Neely in the audience, so I know that she's done a lot on um, graduate student training programs in media work. So I, I don't know all that she's found, but definitely connect with her. She's right in the middle there. Um, and, and I think there's a lot that, there, there is, the culture of science is changing. I think that Joe's right that there is this culture of, that we sort of have to stay out of the fray, that we're not responsible for that. And I think the early, the, I mean, certainly for me, I just think a lot of other grad students in my cohort and since, see it differently and think that it is more of a responsibility to, to be talking about what, what we know as scientists and not have that stop at the, the boundaries of the university. And I think that's an incredibly positive development uh, that, that can only be good for society and for science in the long run. All right, good. Yeah, Eli? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. If in case anybody over there couldn't hear, um, uh, Eli asked. You know, it, I mentioned that uh, opinionated pieces are very popular, and you see that I'm sure you notice in your own social media feeds that they are. Um, but there's kind of a trend these days for explainers and. Actually, at Slate, we had an explainer column uh, from the very beginning, and we actually retired it because it didn't do as well as other more opinionated things. And the, I think the best explainers have a little bit of attitude, have a lot of attitude to them. So uh, there's de there, there is still a, a, a hunger for straight out explanations of things that are confusing, and that's definitely a, a genre that uh, is is an, another thing that we're not necessarily classically trained in as journalists or as scientists, but if you see a way to explain something confusing about the world in a simple chart, um, those stories go bananas these days. People love them. They're very satisfying. They're very shareable. Um, and you know, you, you can do this with opinion too. You know, the, as with anything else, the questions you pick, the way you choose to present them, can uh, can make an argument in itself. But uh, but explainers are also a really good way to communicate. And I think that's also sort of true with fact checker websites that mm, it's sort yeah. of a way of being opinionated without seeming opinionated yeah. but it's the structure of it is what works partly there I think is that it looks you're, you're leading people along that path mm -hmm. starting out like what's the deal with this and winding up here's the deal with this yeah. not yeah. saying opinions on the shape of the earth differ but really saying I investigated and here's what I found yeah. you don't have to do it for yourself now. that's right yeah it's very powerful it's well, sne sneaky and I, I, I would add I mean I guess a lot of my pieces I fall under the explainer category, but I'm trying to do a slightly different kind of explanation, which is, which is what this means in, in, in more human terms. You know? So the fifth assessment report um, 
one of its biggest changes from the fourth assessment report is its use and focus on irreversibility. And, but it doesn't announce that. There's no press release from the IPCC saying we're now a lot more worried about things go are going to be irreversible. So you have to go through. You can count how many times irreversible was used in the, in the synthesis report uh, of the summary for policymakers, the fifth seven, count how many there were in the fourth assessment, and it's, there's, it's night and day. And, you know, for me, for me, the use of the word of irreversible is a way scientists talk about morality. Because anybody can see that if I do harm to you that's, that, that can be fixed, well, I'll just pay or, you know, that's one type of issue. But if I'm doing a harm to people, and of course we're talking of people who, who had no contribution to the harm, that it's irreversible. And it's irreversible, as the you know, IPC says, on a scale of, of hundreds and hundreds of years. That's clearly a whole nother scale of damage. And, and, and they don't use the word morality, but I, I, I view it, in, in my explainer, those are almost equated. Yeah, there's a question over here. Yeah, no, good question. So this is about uh, cultural politicization and how scientists can, can address that. And uh, scientists are, you know, as, as um, Josh was saying, are you know, pretty much uniquely situated to be able to uh, be trusted. Like they're, you know, people will listen to them. They're, there's a huge, uh, very positive reaction to expertise. And um, I, you know, journalists in the room, cover your ears, you don't want to know this. But uh, when, a, when I get a scientist to write, those stories tend to do very well, uh, in some cases better than if a journalist had written the same thing. Um, fortunately for our job security, most scientists don't have the time or the, you know, the, the communication skills to do it. Uh, so we can still keep employing people to do it as a profession. Um, but yeah, whenever a scientist does, it's, it's uh, the, like the potential to get attention, to make people take you seriously, to kind of stop the trolls in their tracks. Um, because the, you know, the, the, the biggest uh, reaction that a lot of opinionated pieces by journalists get you know, immediately in the comments is, you don't know what you're talking about, your PhD is in the wrong field, you know, you're an idiot, and then it gets worse from there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that just sort of changes the whole premise of the conversation. Yeah, I, I, I would add that, um, you know, it's a very, uh, topsy-turvy world that we live in, uh, in the sense that for a doctor, the, and I, it, 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 the notion that the expert diagnostician cannot comment on the treatment without being labeled opinion or politicizing the issue is kind of absurd. If you went to your doctor and he told you, you know, you described all your pre-diabetic conditions and all and never told you well, you're going to have to reduce your this, you're going to have to do diet, exercise, et cetera. I mean, so we live in a world where the world's experts on what the problem is uh, are somehow not allowed to talk about what the solution is without uh, 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 corrupting themselves. We certainly don't view that in any other profession. It's a very weird thing. Um, I think that Everybody has to gauge what they're willing to say. I don't mean that you have to go out and say, I'm, I'm for citizen climate lobby. But, you know, the solution starts with doing nothing is not an option. That's like the first statement you can make. You can then go straight over the IPCC, which talks about carbon budgets and decisions about what the peak temperatures are and peak emissions are. You don't have to, you know, devise the policy solution. but. I will just say, if you go speak in public, if you're going to be a person who speaks in public, you have to be able to answer all the questions. So you have to be able to answer all the tough questions. You can go to skeptical science uh, and, and, and figure out and get the, the best answers uh, uh, to those. But, you know, it's, uh, it is, again, it totally undercuts your credibility to say, I'm only going to describe the most catastrophic threat to humanity that we've ever seen. Solutions? Got nothing to say. I mean, how is that going to convince anybody that you've actually described a problem that you yourself are worried about? So, again, it is a fine line to walk, I will agree. I just don't, I, I just view, uh, and, you know, I worked at the Department of Energy for five years, so that, that has helped. But I just think that it's untenable to go out there 
and just describe the problem. And, and, and I think it's un unfair for someone to accuse you uh, of, of somehow tainting your, your assessment of the problem if you describe any aspect whatsoever of the solution. I just wanted to add something about, you know, what Laura said about, um, you know, having, you know, writing with attitude and what Joe said about writing with voice. I think it's a double-edged sword. I think that, um, you know, for those of you who, who are considering being communicators, you have to understand that how you, how you say your message is, you know, your tone is sometimes going, you know, going to influence and probably will influence how it is received. So, and that's something that I always have to think about as, you know, as a, as a journalist, as someone who blogs as a journalist. And um, I think that, you know, um, you know it, the, the pieces, the, I, I wonder, you know, it, it's, it's telling that the, that, that the pieces at Slate um, are the ones that, you know, have more attitude, that they're the ones that get the most hits, and the explainer ones don't. And if you look at the way, you know, Vox and, and 538 is written, they don't have a lot of attitude. They're trying to write in a very sort of neutral, you know, I, I, I still think they're trying to figure it out, but, you know, and I wonder, you know, is that more effective? Can you, you know, it may not reach as many people, but are you, is that a more effective means of communication than, than writing, you know, with, you know, a morally infused voice? You know, not to say one is better than the other, but I just wonder which is, you know, how, who are you going to, you know, who are you going to reach and, you know, uh, who you intend to reach should matter as well. Yeah, just to add to that, I think the most important thing is to communicate how you feel comfortable. You know, nobody needs to uh, be forced into opinion writing if that's not what you're comfortable with, but it's better to uh, communicate in any way than, than not. And it's possible that even, you know, a little article you write somewhere, given the World Wide Web nowadays, will be uh, seen by someone like Laura or Joe or uh, and, and picked up and they might call you and ask, well, can you, can you write an exciting article about your study about duck genitalia, just jazz it up a bit. And so people do, uh, people do see these articles and, and just more scientific communication, whatever level you feel comfortable with, is great. And one more thing, uh, for any government scientists in the room, uh, journalists very much want to hear from you. There are challenges. Uh, uh, from myself and a number of journalists at reaching government scientists at the EPA or other uh, government agencies. I will say that NOAA is a wonderful exception to that. And, you know, to have an, a phone line into an actual scientist rather than get, as one journalist put it, a crumb, crust of a sentence uh, from a public relations person is a real gift. And so, you know, if your public relations people push back on you, you know, push back on them because we really need to hear from you. And I think just to connect back to the, the, a lot of this connects back to something that the, the original question asked about, you know, the, the idea of the knowledge gap. And I think scientists tend to approach a lot of the, the problems we're talking about as we have all of this knowledge, you need all of this knowledge, how can we get it to you? And that's not really how people make decisions. And that's where tone and voice and personality become really important because people judge messengers not so much based on the knowledge that they seem to have or be offering, but on who they seem to be. So if you come and say, I'm really concerned about climate change because I'm a parent and I want to think about the world that my kids are going to get, or I'm concerned about climate change because I'm an evangelical Christian and, and, I read, and my understanding of the Bible says that this is, this is something I need to do, I need to be worried about this, that's going to affect how people evaluate everything that comes after and how they evaluate the, the solutions and the opinions that you might offer later on. So it's, it's not, the, the tone and the, the personality are, I think, integral to the message. You can't separate that from the desire to communicate information. You have to put yourself into it. If you want to, if you want to cover that knowledge gap, the only way to do that is also to make that, cover that, that personal gap, to make a personal connection.
change behavior? That is a great question. <laughs> I have no answer. About yeah. how to change behavior. <laughs> how to get people to change not just their opinion or their understanding, but how to get them to change their behavior. And I, I mean, communication is obviously the first step towards that. It, Yeah, no, that's, that, that, is, that is some top level stuff, yeah. Some would argue, and I think James Hansen has uh, taken this position, that you know, trying to change you know, behavior is perhaps you know, uh, you know, um, a bit futile, that it's really the, that the solution to climate change is at a political and policy level. So I, as a journalist, I don't try to change anybody's behavior. That's not, I don't feel that's, that's my job. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say um, that You don't want to take on too much, you know. I, communicating well is hard enough and rare enough uh, that that you know that's an important thing to do. I, 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 in other words, I think if your if your goals are huge, if I thought you know uh, that there has to be uh, a limit to two, you know, if if we don't stabilize at two degrees centigrade, then then my blog has failed. But that would be a kind of a tough. So I, I just don't think that, that it's incumbent on, on the, you know, bloggers are just bloggers, you know. I, I, it's very easy to overstate one's importance. And I think, you, you know, it is very clear that climate blogging is a burnout job. If you read climate bloggers, you know that to be the case. Uh, I won't have to name names or sites. So um, it is very easy to get wrapped up in your passions and frustrated by the snail's pace of inaction. No, no more different than I'm sure climate scientists are frustrated about that. Um, uh, but hopefully climate scientists at least, you know, they didn't go into climate science to change the world. They inform the world, the world hopefully will take the facts and do something with it. And I don't see how a blogger can be any different. Um, you know, the political system in this country is what it is. And, you know, if, if if I can't be a successful blogger until the campaign finance system is, is reformed, I'm just setting myself up for failure. So um, I, I will say one thing, which, which the last question had reminded me of, and just one piece of advice if you're going to do opinion journalism, and that is to get an editor. Uh, and that's probably the biggest mistake that I made. I, I, uh, when I set me free to start, you know, I had a lot of freedom to write whatever I wanted. If I thought it was going to be very controversial, I would send it to someone first. But you really don't have your own personal judgment isn't very good about what is or is not going to be problematic. So um, just as you would never publish science that no one else had looked at, you really should not be out there publishing strong opinions that doesn't at least have somebody taking a look at it and saying, why don't you sit on that for a day? Um, why don't you change this? Uh, you know, great piece if you change that word, but if you don't change that word, that word is the only thing anybody is going to care about, and that word you're going to be stuck with because of the internet for a very, very long time. And, you know, many of us learn through trial and error, uh, but unfortunately that means all of our mistakes are, are out there uh, uh, permanently, and, you know, Doctors bury their mistakes, but bloggers, it's for there for everyone to see. <laughs> but I think to the to the question, one one thing that does come back to the to that sort of the, the personal aspect of it is talking about if you do have a venue like that, talking about what you're doing personally. If you've got an audience, these are people who think that they are people like you, and there's a lot of, of social science research that says that the things that we tend to, we, we tend to do the things that we think our neighbors are doing. If you want to get people to increase their energy efficiency, if you tell them that they are in like fifth percent, or you know they're in the 95th percentile of energy use in their neighborhood, they notice that. And especially if you start naming names, but like, oh, you're, we're going to tell your neighbors that you're in the 95th percentile, then people get really scared. But even just saying, here, all your neighbors have done all these energy efficiency things, and you're being a slob, you need to do something, people do respond to that. And so just putting that out there of like, this is a normal thing for people like us. We, we who read and write this blog, or we who read and write this newspaper, or whatever it is, that can be incredibly effective. And, and, and there's nothing, political action is part of that. Wearing a completely different hat from my, my 
501c3 nonprofit work, I'm on the board of a political action committee that tries to elect scientists to office. All of you should run for office. You should run for school board. We need school board members who understand science. We need members of Congress who understand science. There are like, what, one? <laughs> I mean, Rush Holt is retiring. He's going to AAAS, which is great for AAAS. But it's like, other than that, who's left, really? Um, so, and there are, there are great opportunities there. There's nothing stopping that level also. And scientists tend, for the same sorts of reasons that we've been talking about, to be leery of doing that work. But who, who should people vote for who are actually going to take this issue seriously? That's important. Um, and there are groups like Climate Hawk Vote that do really important work to track which candidates. And I'm not, as a, as a member, as a representative of 501c3, vote for whoever you like. I take no position as, as an NCSE staffer, but the Franklin's List that I'm on the board of and uh, Climate Hawks Vote are good resources of information for, for um, how, how politicians have voted on science-related issues. Yeah, another question back there. I think the, as I think about it, and I'm curious what everyone else, I'll answer briefly because I touched on this already, but emphasizing what we, what we don't know and what we're trying to learn as a way of saying this is, this is what we do know, this is what everything builds on. Having gotten that far, this is what's interesting. So we all, we can all agree that, you know, common ancestry is true, but does natural selection or mutation or, uh, or uh, random drift dominate the evolutionary, evolutionary history, right? That's, we've gotten this far, what's the next step? We know that some dinosaurs had feathers, which ones didn't, right? That, that gets to be really interesting. Um, and, and, it, and it doesn't leave a lot of room for, well, evolution is all wrong because you're taking that as given. And then you're going to what don't we know and why don't we know it and how are we going to find out? And I think that that's, that's a great way to grab people. People love those sorts of stories. And I think I'm sure that that's part of why the things written by scientists get, get so much play because it opens that door a little bit that people don't usually see. Science is presented as this monolith of like, here's knowledge, here's an encyclopedia, read through it, there's going to be a test later. But there's a lot more interesting stuff going on, and it's that interesting stuff. It's the way that you got there that distinguishes that from, say, creationism, where, I mean, if it's just two books that you're holding up next to each other, why should you choose one book over the other? It's, it's how they got there that becomes really important. Yeah, I, I think um, science is a process, is what you're saying. I, and I think this, you know, there are science journals that excel at that. And I think with respect to climate change, you know, Joe, talks about, um, he and I don't always agree on, you know, the media's failures, but, but I do think that the media had, could do a, such a better job at presenting, you know, the larger picture of, you know, how science works. And I do think that would, that, in, that would enrich the, the climate discourse, that would help educate people. So we weren't stuck in these, you know, in these kinds of debates that, you know, we've been spinning our wheels with about, um, you know, with climate change, and especially there was a, a a, uh, a panel that I attended before that talked about um, how to, you know, approaching uncertainty, how to deal with uncertainty in the climate. And it was an excellent, excellent session. And I took away a lot from that as a journalist. And, and I think that's, you know, that's something I think that, you know, you know my colleagues could do a much better job at. And, and, and I would say that, um, you know, one of the criticisms of scientists who communicate uh, is, and, and how the media portrays that is, is that we don't talk about the things we know with high certainty a lot, because those aren't scientifically interesting. So scientists like to talk about the frontiers, you know, uh, do, does, is, is the lo loss of Arctic ice causing more extreme weather? What is the impact of, of climate change on tornadoes, frequency or intensity? So, you know, things that, that may not be fully settled, but uh, when you talk to the public, it's very important to go through the things that are known with very high certainty. You know, I mean, the, 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 it's un, the warming is unequivocal, and it's always worth saying. Unequivocal is a very strong word. 
uh, for, for scientists to use. The National Academy said it was a settled fact. So, you know, th there are some things you know so well that they're not going to be overturned because there's just too many interlocking things. So it is up to scientists to say the things they know, you know, for near certainty um, and, and things that they're less certain about. I think one can talk about scenarios. I, 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 again, I, I think one can talk about the plausible worst case scenario without saying this is what's going to happen. You know, you can, we obviously don't know what the level of emissions are going to be. You can say our best guess if we keep doing what we're doing is this is going to happen and this is pretty bad, but we have a, a, a path to avoid it. Um, and I, I'd also say that, um, you know, th there is a profession that, that communicates uncertainty pretty well and still motivates a lot of behavior change, and that's the medical profession. And you go to your doctor, he hardly ever gives you a certainty diagnosis. I mean, if there's a spot on an x-ray, maybe. But there's a lot of ambiguity in diagnoses or even looking at whether something is cancerous or precancerous or whatever it is. And we've all been in talking to doctors, and we all like the 100% certainty answer, and they hardly ever want to give it to us because, of course, they don't want to be sued if it turns out that one in 100 case that they're wrong. So they have learned over time how to communicate with authority uncertainty and still motivate a lot of behavior change. So it can be done. It's not easy. Now, of course, they get a lot of practice. They're, the doctors, you know, you go to a lot of schooling and you get a lot of practice talking to patients. Scientists don't get any such practice at all. It isn't easy. You need the practice. It is really hard to deliver news that ain't great to somebody who isn't that thrilled about hearing about it, but still is pretty knows that they need to know and may have to do something significant as a result. It takes a lot of practice. So no one should think that any one of us without practice could just go out and do it because the people who do it well have done it a lot of practice and they've been taught by people who've done it for decades. And in terms of, I mean, in, from, from the work that I've done with creationism and on climate change, screwing up is part of, is, is important, like seeing how, what do they take out of context? A lot of times that reflects some deep misconception and recognizing that and seeing what do people jump on? What do people, how do they twist those words to make it seem as if I'm saying something I'm not? Mm -hmm. There are really valuable lessons in that too, even though it feels awful when it happens. If you can learn from it, uh, it makes you better teachers, better communicators, all of that. Um, and and all, in the long run, it's all for the, to, to mm -hmm. the good. Yeah, so I'm an editor and uh, this comes up a lot, uncertainty comes up a lot when I'm uh, editing writers, and uh, it's actually rhetorically a, a very uh, you know, good strategy. If there is some uncertainty, if something's conflicting, acknowledge it, explain it, explain it away, and it defangs the argument. Um, and it's perfectly fine in, in, in many cases to say, you know, this, you know, the sky is blue, we don't really know why. I mean, we do, but um, so it's, it's actually fine. It kind of, it makes you as a communicator seem trustworthy, like you're not hiding anything, like you're giving both sides of the argument. And then of course you go on to make your side of the argument. So it can, you can use it to your advantage when there's uncertainty. I think we have time for one more question. So certainly NCSE's policy is, is to be against debates like that, like the Ken Ham, Bill Nye debate. Although we did help Bill Nye get ready for it once it was gonna happen. We wanted him to win um, or, or, and to come off as, as positively as possible. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I think debate, there are, not, there are not two sides to the question of whether the earth is round, right? There are some things that are not debatable they're top, the, you know, if someone gets invited to a debate, this happens a lot, we get contacted by a scientist who some creationist says, hey, will you come to do a debate? Or a radio station says, hey, will you come on and debate this guy on the air because it'll fill 30 minutes, right? Sometimes you can change the topic. So instead of will you come and debate evolution, which no, it's, that happened, it was, it's in the literature, you can read all the science that has been done on this, we're not gonna debate something that we've resolved. And this is something you were, a lot of, of Texas headlines. We were just in, with Texas textbooks, there was an exercise that 
was proposed that would have had something from IPCC and on the opposite page, something from the Heartland Institute. Mm -hmm. And students were just supposed, in the social studies textbook, just like debate, is human, are humans causing climate change based on these two sources? It was bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's misleading in, in really profound ways to do that. But what should Houston do about climate change? What should Houston do about rising sea levels? That's an interesting debate. You should have that debate in a social studies class. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with, did T-Rex have feathers? That's interesting. I can spend a lot of time talking about that. And there are going to be different opinions. So shifting to a real active live, to one of these frontier topics, rather than a core scientific topic that has been resolved. That's one way. Or so switching to, from the science, which is not resolved by stage debate, to how should Christians think about evolution? Right, you've got Ken Ham on one hand, um, Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health on the other. Both evangelical Christians coming to very different conclusions. That's an interesting debate. Ken Ham debating an old earth creationist could be really interesting. It, you know, it, it gives you the same food fight without making it seem as if evolution is actually debatable or climate change or any of these other things. So there, there are ways to defang it and move it in a productive direction, move it to a policy debate, move it to, to frontier science, move it to something in, in a different social realm that where, where debate is an appropriate way to raise those questions. It can be done, um, but it, it often should be shut down. And, you know, I, I think uh, I have I think the consensus among the people, the scientists I know, is 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 one should not debate and and should make that very clear. Uh, you know, you can Google online. I think it was the exchange between uh, Richard Dawkins and Stephen Jay Gould about their coming to the same conclusion. It's it's a losing proposition in part because you're just giving equal time to non-science, and it, it is inconceivable that the public public aren't trained scientists. So on what basis would they adjudicate a debate? You know, uh, as I talk about in my book, th this is a very old notion. In, in the dialogue Gorgias by Plato, in which he's talking about the great rhetorician Gorgias and trying to make him, he's not a fan of rhetoric because he's a fan of, of rationality, not, not winning arguments with emotions. Gorgias says, I could go into any city in Greece with a doctor and we would debate in front of the town elders who should be the town doctor, and I would always win. Because that's what he was an expert at, winning debates. And it's a stu again, it's a 25th century old art. It's just very different than science. A debate is a sport. Yeah, and well, it's, 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 it's driven around emotions and credibility. Who is the most credible sounding person? Do I have the most consistent story that's gonna ring true to people? Scientists, as you know, and I, it, you know, it's sort of well known, but if you, I have a seven and a half year old daughter, you know, she's been bombarded by thousands and thousands of stories by the time she's seven and a half, and this is gonna filter her entire world view. The way scientists talk is not how the hero in great stories talks. The hero is a very certain person. Hardly ever does, do heroes, do Harry Potter say probably, or with a 95% confidence level. <laughs> and um, so it's just, it, it's, it's very hard for someone who is not trained in the art of debate to beat someone who does, no matter what the facts are, because the audience has no basis for knowing what the facts are. I mean, I guess you could go on Google. So I think it's a, it's a generally losing proposition to debate. I realize it can be hard to, uh, it can look weak to be not willing to debate, but it's still better than, than having the debate. Science is not decided by debate. The royal, you know, the, the, the motto of the Royal Academy is uh, the oldest scientific society in the world, uh, the British Royal Society, is nullus in verbia. Words mean nothing. Now, the problem is, to most people, words mean everything. But in science, they don't. And we set up a process. The governments of the world set up a process to figure out what's going on. Let the scientists debate and let them write a summary. And the politicians are going to go through line by line the stuff and it's been done. That was the debate. You, I mean, obviously, you can debate with that, but then you're not debating the science. That was the world government set up the IPCC for a reason. We just skipped the last. I mean, if you know, world has a problem, 
complicated, get the experts together, have them figure out the problem, uh, the solution, and report to the world and do something about it. And we've done all that except the last part. And for some reason, we've treated this whole process as if that's the beginning of a debate. It's not. It was the beginning of a debate as to what to do. You know, so again, it, that's just a failure of communication by IPCC, and I will state for the record, it is, it is shameful that in the year 2014, the IPCC could put out reports that read as incomprehensible as they do after being so widely criticized for so many years for putting out incomprehensible reports on, by the way, a Sunday morning. So, you know, it's embarrassing. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, let me switch this. Oh yeah. So if you're interested in this, we have another session uh, tonight, uh, five to six, on improving your social media presence, using it more effectively. Uh, so I hope you can make that too. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.